Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we're super excited to be here today. Um, my name is Klaus. I am with Maker's Place, uh, leading marketing and growth there. Maker's Place is uh, the premier marketplace for digital art. Um, my, my background is, is in, from Silicon Valley. I'm, I'm from the technology side, but I'm passionate about art, and I'm so fortunate to be in a company that uh, celebrates art. So I um, would like to introduce my, my fellow panelists. Oh, P Perrin, you made it. I cannot speak now. Thank, <laughs> thank you, traffic of the NFT. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to New York. Speak now. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. We'll, we'll, we'll wait with you till the end then. Um, <laughs> let me introduce my, my fellow uh, panelists here real quick. Uh, right next to me, we have Chris uh, Christian Levine, uh, also known as No Creative. He's a 3D artist working out of Copenhagen, Denmark, with 15 years of experience across multiple disciplines in the creative industry, including the traditional art space and fine arts photography. He's known for striking, highly detailed 3D cloth and interior environment work, and is a thought leader in this space. He's also a co-founder of the Bloom Collective. Um, next to uh, Chris, we have Caitlin Crookshank. Crookshank. There, there you go. go. Yeah. Scottish, it's not easy. She's, uh, she's part of the Maker's Place team. She works in the, the business development uh, team. And before she joined Maker's Place in 2021, she spent her career in the traditional auction world. She's having worked, uh, had worked at auction houses in Edinburgh, London, Amsterdam, Denver, and Chicago, and New York. And she was the business director at Sotheby, and she now specializes in creative onboarding for high-level artists at Maker's Place. And next to her, we have Saxa Freedy. Saxa Freedy is Pakistan-born, but New York City-based, multidisciplinary artist. He makes futuristic art inspired by ancient South Afri Asian and Middle Eastern cultures. He comes to art with background as a creative director in advertising, and he studied advertising at the Academy of Art and Sculpture at this Art Students League of New York. He's also the proud recipients of a Gold Can Lion Awards and a United Nation Awards for Peace and Understanding. Wow. Thank you. Great to be here. And last but not least, welcome. Iranian-born Parin Haideri comes from a multicultural world. In her career spanning over 15 years, she's been blessed to work with some of the world's leading brands as a graphic designer, illustrator, and art director. Since joining the NFT space in 2021, she's, her work has been thrust under the spotlight with, while, with her art being critically acclaimed. And she was a featured artist on Time Magazine's Genesis NFT drop. On, she has been featured on OpenSea, X2Y2, Known Origin, and after I invited her to join this panel, I also hired her, so she also now works at Maker's Place. <laughs> uh, welcome to all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll start with, uh, with a little warm-up question here. Um, I'll start with you, Chris. Uh, what was, in one minute or less, what was your first experience with NFTs? So I got onboarded to Maker's Place back in late 2020. Minded my first piece December 24th and it sold that night um, for $100. And I was basically like mind blown that someone would buy my digital art. Um, so yeah, that, that was my first, well, I heard about NFTs earlier, but that was my first real experience with it. Fantastic. I wish I had bought that for $100, <laughs> if only. Um, my first experience with NFTs, um, I was working as a business director at an auction house and had spent almost three years working on bringing a rare old master painting to auction, sold for $90 million. I thought, God, this is you know, such a major success. Four weeks later, the Beeple's Every Day sold at Christie's, and it was like all of the air in the art market was sucked out of the room. Every gallery, every artist, every museum, every single person at every auction house I knew was talking about NFTs and digital art and how this was going to be, you know, lead to the future of the art world. I was fascinated and was dying to get involved. I was curious to know. I knew that there was a, a marketplace uh, kind of connected to that sale, and it ended up being Maker's Place. And um, I've been here for with Maker's Place for a year and a half now, and certainly will never look back on this space. It's it's been so wonderful to be a part of it. How about you? Um, so around the Beeple's. Uh, first sale, I minted my first, uh, I was introduced to the world of NFTs uh, through this amazing human being called, his name is J.N. Silva, 
and um, I minted my first piece, and he was my first collector. And with the proceeds from the sale of that, I went and I um, my first NFT that I bought was um, some um, some cards some uh, from this project called Parallel. Uh, it's a it's a cool sci-fi game. And then a couple of months later, they airdropped me this other piece, which I, I ended up selling for like 19 ETH. Uh, so that was my first <laughs> experience oh with wow, NFT. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you, Parallel and Jan Silva, and all the amazing other people that I've met in the space since. How about you, Perrin? So um, my first NFT experience is actually very funny. It's in April 20, March 2021. It started on Clubhouse. I don't know how many of you ever heard of Clubhouse, but it started on Clubhouse Room. I'm Iranian, so English is my second language. And those days, I did not have this confidence at all to speak like in front of everyone. So I was invited to one of these stages on Clubhouse to speak, and I just left. That was my first experience. But the day after, I joined the stage once again, and I talked about my art for like five seconds. I was so nervous. I couldn't speak to like 200 people that I didn't even know who they were. And the CEO of USA Skateboarding collected my piece. So that was my first experience. It was for $150, <laughs> again, a 0.1 ETH, I guess. And it just started that day. And then I gained confidence. I traveled all over the world. Thanks to the NFTs, I moved to the States. And this has been incredible <laughs> the whole journey i remember being in some of those clubhouse rooms with you <laughs> that's great it's it's changing lives uh, and and just in a couple of years things have changed a lot so the 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 name of this panel is called the art world disruption and progress so we want to talk about some trends so chris i want to start with you uh what are some of the major trends that you're seeing as as nfts are, are disrupting the art industry well for one, that we are actually seeing digital art in galleries and museums. We got uh, Rafik in the MoMA. Um, I've been in established galleries around the world, which is mind blowing to me. And like, we are seeing a lot more interest from the traditional world. I've been in and out of um, the, tr the traditional world through my career, well, the traditional art world through my career and Digital art has never, like, no one ever paid attention to it. Like, it, it was basically worthless, right? So, so that's one of the trends I'm really seeing and really excited about. That's cool. Uh, Perrin, you, you told me a, a story yesterday when we were hanging out uh, about how you went to traditional galleries many years ago. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. So, um I, I make one-line drawings. I draw line drawings with two hands ambidextrously. And it was my hobby for so many years, but I always wanted to sell my pieces at traditional ga galleries as well, way before NFTs. Um, I used to live in Italy, and this goes back to like 12 years ago. I brought my line drawings to one gallery that I really wanted to show my pieces there and sell pieces there. And the gallery owner was like, what's this? And I was like, this is line drawing. I made them all with like two hands and I was very excited about my creativity. <laughs> and she said, no way I sell these pieces there because it's only a line. Mm -hmm. And in the NFTs, um, I, I brought the same pieces, same line art, nothing has changed. And I was reached uh, by um, Keith Grossman, uh, president of Time Magazine. And he invited me to Time Magazine like two years ago. So that was the difference. For many years, I thought my line drawings are so worthless because they're just a line. And the NFTs people kept telling me like, wow, these lines, we see how many years you worked on that to have this minimal drawing. So that was a very big shock for me in a good way. And now the same owner of the gallery, like a couple of months ago, he reached out to me and he was like, I would love to have your pieces. I was like, no way, I show you, give you my pieces now because this is the same art, but only because I'm featured in different places I don't think my art has been different. So that was that was a great experience for me to, to be accepted like in the NFTs as who I am. <laughs> I, I love that. And and I think you can sort of talk about it's the democratization of art, right? Uh, that 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 talented people that might not have gotten an in in the old model all of a sudden have a chance to get in. 
So, so Caitlin, like you come from a different angle at, at Makerspace. How, how are you seeing that democratization come to life in, in a marketplace? It's, it's amazing how different it is. Um, and I've, I've worked for auction houses all over the, the place. And I was having a similar discussion about this um, on the panel I was in on for NFT Paris. It was an all-female panel of curators. And we started talking about just the, the barriers to access. That at an auction house, you normally can, you have a list of criteria, essentially. Um, condition, the provenance, who the artist was. Uh, you know, can you possibly guarantee that it was actually done by the artist? You know, all of these, the, you're, you essentially say, okay, four or five boxes were ticked. So thus, this has value and can go into an auction. So anyone else who is outside of the box, anyone who is doing something new, something different, especially in the medium of digital art, missed, I think, a big moment of representation there. And that's where Web3 and being able to sell digital art as NFTs has changed and disrupted everything. Like the, the biggest thing that's been incredible for me to see being a part of the space is representation and how an artist can, you can be someone who is in the space really early on. You can be, I met a 20-year-old a woman yesterday at the Women in Web3 breakfast who said, I've just started selling my pieces and, and she wants to sell on Maker's Place and she's got a piece on foundation. And I thought, this is so inspiring that the barriers have been so pulled down. It's no longer a checklist. It's more value is, is derived and driven off of just what people are passionate about. If you have good quality, great art, you can mint it as NFTs and be successful. That's, that's amazing. And, and, and I'm just looking at the states, Iran, Pakistan, Denmark, United States. I mean, we have, we have representation here, but, but uh, you know, on Maker's Place, when I saw Ukrainian artists connecting with a collector in Silicon Valley, or we can put together a show with African artists uh, and, and, and spread that to the world, that's, that's beautiful. Um, Let's move on to, uh, to, to next question, Sachs, for you uh, as an artist, what, what are some of the differences and advantages that you see uh, of NFTs? Um, so as, a, uh, as an artist coming from the more the, the traditional art world side after years of similar struggles of trying to get into galleries and getting people to kind of look at your work and building uh, a small collector base that way, uh, coming in onto the NFT side was just so freeing because it was um, a, a whole new uh, spectrum of people from around the world and not just, you know, New York City and a few clicks and things like that. So the clicks went out the door, uh, w w which I loved, and it was democratized and just opened up. Uh, so I was exposed to a lot more people who, uh, especially through Twitter spaces and Clubhouse and things like that, we're open to hearing the, uh, the ideas and everything that goes behind the work and the opportunity to speak of the work to a, to a larger audience was, uh, uh, was really good. But then also, I, I, I sort of framed uh, my artwork in a way where, like for example, I, I have a, a series called Woven Portals that I made um, on entirely in Adobe Illustrator and it's vector-based art using blend tools and that's the, the entire series. So when I sell those NFTs. I also give a, a PDF of the artwork as well because it's vector, it can be blown up to any size. And so the printability is the ut utility essentially of, of those artworks. So uh, people then have the opportunity to print that and keep them keep it for themselves, but then also have uh, the, the, the digital uh, version of it as well. Um, so that straddled both sides. And then more recently, I've been, um, using a lot of AI in, in, in my work as well, just you know, like, like a lot of artists in this space. And what's funny is my handmade works looked generative, and now my generative works look handmade. <laughs> and what I'm trying to do is um, take uh, my AI-based work that, are that, that look handmade and then take it into the real world and collaborate with artists and craftsmen and artisan from Pakistan, from Iran, and uh, and make some of these pieces uh, uh, as physical art wow. works as well. So uh, almost re trying to reverse, uh, not trying to, but it just happened to be a, a reverse engineering uh, of it at the same time. So it starts with AI in the United States and turns into a physical painting in Pakistan. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm wor like right now I'm working with a miniaturist uh, I in Pakistan, and these are works that have been initially created off based of our previous work that we've done together. But now with AI, we're able to um, just be a lot more prolific with it. So that's another advantage. That's a great, well. great example. Well, so talk about disruption, talk about AI. How, how do we feel about that, Chris? How are, are you? Are you all in, or what do you think of AI as as a tool for a, an artist? Well, that's that's a poisonous one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard yeah, like I don't know if I have a real opinion about AI art because it, it's moving so fast and it's so new, and I'm using it. I work as a 3D artist. Uh, it's my the daily job. We're using it at work. Like it's it's not something we can fight. Like. I see it kind of like when photography came into the world, right? Like every painter and everyone started yelling about it basically that like, what is this photography? Like wh what are we gonna do with it? We, we don't know how to use it yet. We, we don't know what's gonna happen with it. So basically I see it as a tool. We need to learn how to utilize any way you can and like I'm instead of going on Pinterest now I go into mid journey and I type in what I kind of want to create and use that as inspiration instead of Pinterest um, I use it for textures in my works like it's it's very useful and it's very interesting and it's moving incredibly fast that's very cool so you you use it as inspiration and as a tool now Going back to the marketplace, like if you put yourself in the collector's shoes, uh, I mean, we've had a lot of discussions about that at, at Maker's Place. Like, well, what does the collector expect? And what should we disclose to the collector? Wha what do you think about that, Caitlin? It, there's, I think one of the great things about um, the digital art world, or maybe there's so many people in the traditional space. I always felt, at least when I, when I was at Sotheby's, that they thought about digital art and they thought there's only one aesthetic, there's only one thing happening. And that's not really the case, but when I would talk to collectors, uh, there was, it was a really narrow focus. And since I've been more a part of this world, I've been blown away at how many different materials, mediums, how many different genres there are, and true artistic styles that are, that are coming out of what's being produced right now. I find it, crazy inspiring to be a part of it because I'm an appreciator, I'm not a creator myself, but I'm the daughter of a painter and it's so hard for creatives, you know, they, they have to, you have to make money to be able to support that as something that you're able to do full time. And it feels really great to be one of those people that just helps artists make money, essentially. It gives me a lot of gratification. But on the collector side, I think when you have a marketplace, when you have people, you know, at Similarly, at Maker's Place, like I, I love all of my colleagues, but I also have a lot of other friends who work in galleries or other marketplaces. That inspiration and that passion that the staff have who work there, I mean, some of them are artists themselves, many of them are, like Perrin, but that is passed along so well to the collectors, and I think then you can really help collectors in the space, or even people who are just coming into the space, because I work with a lot of traditional collectors as well, you can help them find what is the thread that really drives you. We're passionate about tons of different things because we see the burst of creativity that's happening. But if you are hyper-focused on AI, let us help you find some phenomenal artists in that area. Maybe your collection is something more simple. I spoke to a woman who said, my collection is about light and that's all I'm looking for. And I want a little bit of everything. And I thought that was so interesting. And I said, oh, that can go anywhere in this space. But for collectors, there's so much to dive into. There's so much happening right now that it'll be, you know, it's a, a schism where when you read art history textbooks that come out in 20 years, this will be the moment that everyone is talking about. And that passion is really easily, I think, passed along to collectors right now. So everyone should be collecting. This is the moment, absolutely. Fantastic. All right, so, so we talked about, you just mentioned 20 years from now. We talked about trends and how it's been disrupting uh, the art world today. But parent, five years from now, three years, five years, 10 years, if you look into the crystal ball, what do you want to see for this industry and community? Uh, uh, 
What, what, what are you seeing? It's a very interesting question. Um, if you know Web3 and NFTs, the word community is the first thing that we keep hearing because it's very different from traditional art world for so many aspects. And we see a lot of artists enter the space and they cannot be successful no matter what their background they come from because they mainly do not have their communities. So we saw a lot of celebrities with so many millions of fans entering Web3, but they cannot sell a piece or like more than like 10 pieces. Maybe it happens a lot because Web3 is all based on human connections. The reason that we're all here, it's because we somehow removed the middlemen in Web3. Uh, there are galleries that they entered uh, NFT space, which is great for onboarding, let's say, traditional artists to Web3. But if an artist, if a single artist wants to be successful, in my opinion, without a community, it's impossible. And it needs to be genuine. It needs to be like, we need to be just ourselves in this community. And I feel like um, more authentic, <laughs> the better, because you just bring your art, no matter what you do, if you're consistent in the space, you will be successful. So three years from now, five years from now, I think the sense of community will probably never fade away, in my opinion. It will stay here. But also the technology of blockchain that has been around for a couple of years and now it's becoming something very important is going to evolve to way bigger, I think, technologies in general. Because for myself, in my own experience, if I want to talk about it, I was graphic, I mean, I do graphic design still, but that was my main job. And art was always my passion. Now it's not only painting, I'm thinking about immersive experiences. I'm thinking about doing a lot of in real lifetime um, drops, which means, for example, I make a piece right now and you collect that and that changes according to seasons. So if you look at your wallet, for example, the piece that you collected from me two weeks ago might be different now. So these are all technologies of blockchain that we can work with metadata. A lot of collaborations happened in Web3 that no way it could happen in Web2. Like I worked with Timbaland and I was like, the, the moment that I was reached out by them, I was like, no way, I work with Timbaland. And it happened in Web3. I know a lot of artists that they work with very big musicians, very big filmmakers, that it's just like dream, but it happens in Web3 because the connections happens because we're just human beings. And I think that sense is gonna be way more important in the next couple of years. AI is gonna probably take over a lot of parts of industry, in my opinion, as well. But technology of blockchain, I think it's something that we need to learn, we need to focus on. And artists, traditional artists, need to, in my opinion, learn that as well to bring new, new horizons to their pieces. So I think it's gonna be incredible in five years. I, I love the optimism. Um, Sachs, can you beat that on the optimism? What do you think is gonna I'm happen? I'm with you. I'm, I'm totally with you. Uh, I, yeah, you kind of you, you, you said it. Uh, I, there will be, I think the terms will change. Uh, or like today, if we look at it, there's a certain industry. So I work with brands as well. Uh, and uh, my, I, have a, I have a day job as a, a creative director in advertising and I also do art. It's not necessarily on the side. There are parallels, I do them both. Um, and I've brought uh, Web3 to some of our clients and uh, uh, one of my main clients, White Castle, has actually embraced uh, Web3 and they did a collection and are into uh, the, the, the idea of it, but also recognize that it's still very early and words like uh, NFTs are, can be toxic in certain um, r environments and certain uh, conversations and things like that. So I think Starbucks, for example, has done a really good, uh, good way of um, not using that word, but still being in Web3, and I think more and more uh, brands are going to start doing it, and more people and consumers uh, are going to start uh, being in Web3 without even realizing it. So a lot of these uh, terminologies uh, that, that we're struggling with and uh, today won't be there, I think, a few years from now. And uh, th these are revolutionary, smart contracts are revolutionary new things that, uh, that feel very daunting today, but I think in a few years' time, they'll, it'll just be part of the norm, like, like AI will as well. Yeah, yeah, it becomes more normal. Uh, Caitlin, anything to add? 
Uh, for me, it's I just want to see more digital art everywhere. I, you're just now starting to see museums and institutions. Everyone who's here should definitely go to MoMA and, and see unsupervised. It's phenomenal. But I am excited to see more digital art in galleries, more digital art um, shown on billboards even. I want digital art in museums, institutions. I want it in auction houses. It is very mainstream already, digital art was. After being a, a category that people didn't focus on for collecting, you've got great digital art that was being produced in the 60s and 70s that people aren't, you know, just, they just were not focused on um, how to buy it, how to display it. I, I am also excited to see this um, question of, I speak to a lot of people who say, I don't know how to display my digital art. And you can do it so wonderfully and so beautifully in many of the events we've done together. We've gone out of our way to give the feeling of an interior to our booths that we set up. We'll have plants and sculptures and furniture right. with salon style hangs because there is some hesitation for, I think, a large group of people to think, I don't want my home to look like a Best Buy, but I would like to display these things in the space that I love so much, you know, my, my comfort zone. And we're just starting to see that happening. I can't wait to open Architectural Digest and see digital art projections, to see screens, to see, right. you know, uh, so much of this interesting hybrid of art um, displayed more in the mainstream. And I think we'll see a ton of that over the next five years. And Christian, what about you? Three, five years? Well, the provenance is probably the most important thing here, the, the proof of ownership. And I, I feel like we are already seeing it. I'm being approached by festivals, by on the NDA, but something with votes that wants to do NFTs. And the, the, the fact that digital art now has value as it didn't before, like I've been a, a digital artist for 15 years and the only way to make a living from it was in the commercial industry or in the VFX industry. And the fact that I can create whatever I want now and make money on it because I can prove ownership is probably the most important thing about this. And like it'll slowly flow into the institutions. Like I would, if I was to buy, which I'm not, a Rothko, I would really love a proof of ownership on the blockchain for it. I would love it for my mortgage. I would love it for anything important. So what I'm seeing in five years is that what we're talking about now, the NFT space, is just going to be something that runs in the background. And it's going to be ownership yes. of tickets, of your car, of your house, of a lot of things. And yeah. Right. I love that. I, a lot of, of, of great things you guys have said. I'll, I'll add my own two cents uh, on it. Like three to five years, I think you'll see a lot less friction. Like we're going to get rid of the, all the terminology you talk about, Sachs. We're not going to be talking about NFTs. It's going to be easy to set up a crypto wall. You don't even have to think about it. It's like getting an email address. And, and I want to get us to a place We should still say GM, though. Say what? We should still say GM. GM, yes. And friends, F-R-E-N-S. <laughs> Uh, we're all going to still wag me. <laughs> there you go. But I want us to get to a place where we're not talking about digital art. We're just talking about art. Uh, the analogy to music, like the computer didn't destroy music. It didn't destroy the guitar or the drums. It's just another instrument. We're playing instruments. And the DJ uh, can team up with, uh, with the drummer and create great music. And it's the same here. So that's where we're going to go to, right? Yeah. You guys yeah. agree? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Wag me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's our time. Thank you so much for, for joining me here on Thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.